station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. KFMB TV, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Yes, this is Heather Myers from CBS San Diego KFMB TV. Hello, Heather, we have you loud and clear. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. What a great start to my Friday talking to astronauts, Megan MacArthur and Shane Kimbrough. Oh my goodness, first of all, how are both of you doing up there? I think we're doing pretty well. We've been here for about three weeks, so we're, uh, we're settled in nicely and adapted pretty well. Shane, what was it like on the SpaceX Crew Dragon just getting to the International Space Station? What was that like for you? It was a fantastic ride. Uh, I think all of us, when we were sitting on the launch pad for a couple hours, getting ready to go, preparing mentally and uh, somewhat physically as well. And then when the engines lit, uh, big smiles came across all of our faces um, as we felt that power lift us uh, from Earth up into space. It was an incredible ride for the first eight and a half to nine minutes um, while the boosters were lit and a lot of G-forces, a lot of different sensations our bodies were going through. And then uh, after nine minutes, we were in space and floating around. So pretty cool experience. And Megan, I'm watching both of you float around and there's somebody else behind you, another astronaut floating around too. Do you ever get used to the zero gravity environment? Um, it's that's a great question. I don't know that you ever get used to it. Of course, I've spent all of my life uh, on Earth, except for a few brief business trips into space, and so you adapt to it. But I think our you know our primary um, experience is still on Earth in a one G environment. So you get good at it. You get good at flying around and being efficient with your movements. But I think your brain is still pretty well wired for one G. What about some of the simple things that we take for granted? Things like brushing your teeth, taking a shower. Are all of those things so much more trivial? Well, you actually have to think about them a lot more here than you do on Earth. Um, for instance, we don't have sinks up here, so we're used to swallowing our toothpaste <laughs> these days. So that's not one of the benefits of being an astronaut, but it's one of the perks, I guess, and that we get to do. Um, showering is another thing. We don't have showers up here, so we just have towels that have soap inside of them and you, you wet those down and then you wipe off every day. Uh, we do get a little bit sweaty up here as we work out about two hours a day. So showers or what we call showers are very important um, for us to maintain uh, good hygiene up here. And I could not do an interview with astronauts from the International Space Station unless I asked about the food. What do you eat up there and how do you store it? We have a variety of different kinds of food um, that's either been dehydrated or irradiated to preserve it. So the dehydrated food maybe, for example, like a beef stroganoff, so um, beef with noodles. We rehydrate that, and then we have a warming oven that we can put that in. We give it, you know, maybe 20 or 30 minutes, and then you, you cut open the package with a pair of scissors, and we pretty much eat all of our food with a spoon out, out of the packages. We have different kinds of soups. We have lots of different kinds of drinks, hot or cold. We do have a refrigerator. But, um, you know, they work really hard to give us a great food system and a lot of variety. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, not like eating out in a restaurant at home, but they, they give us lots of great nutrition and as much variety as they can manage. So then, Megan, what have you been craving since you've been up there that obviously you can't get? Well, you know, I'm a California girl, so I really miss my avocados. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say a burrito. You're a good California girl. <laughs> um, what is the toughest part for both of you about being away from your families and how have you been in contact with them? 
Well, of course, that is really the hardest part of living in space uh, for long duration is being away from your families and your loved ones. Um, we have good connectivity. We're uh, able to make phone calls uh, during the day, and then once a week we get a video chat with our families, so that's nice. Um, but I have a seven-year-old son who isn't super excited about sitting still for a long time, so mom can talk to him. But we do the best we can. I try to talk with them a little bit every day, and of course my husband as well. And then I check in with my uh, sisters and brother and my parents every once in a while too. And Shane, what about you? Pretty much the same for me. I mean, it's Shane, Yeah, it's pretty much the same. We have great connectivity like she said. We have the ability to talk to our loved ones daily, which is awesome. And uh, for me, the video conference is great because three of my children are in different cities and they can tie in my wife and all three kids on the same screen for me so that we can all talk at the same time on the weekends during the video chat. Obviously, being up at the International Space Station, you're tasked with a lot of duties during the day. And from what I read, a lot of different scientific type of experiments going on up there. What do you think has been the most interesting thing that you've been able to do so far? One of the things that is interesting about living on the space station is you're the one doing the science work as well as the one fixing the toilet. So you can cover both things in one day, which is interesting and also challenging just to have to be able to switch your brain from one thing to another. The experiment that's taking up most of my time right now is called celestial immunity, and it's a really interesting experiment that involves looking at immune pathways that hopefully will help us discover new treatments for different diseases. So it's a great um, experiment for me to be involved in. I'm, I don't, I'm not a biologist. Um, by training and so it's really interesting for me to be working through an experiment like this and I have an expert that's looking over my shoulder via camera and she can talk with me kind of step by step as we go through the process to make sure that I get all the intricate steps right. And I noticed that you also have a, a penguin looking over your shoulder or right in front of you. Who is that and what's that all about? Um, Gwyn Gwyn is our zero G indicator that we brought up with us on the uh, Crew Dragon. And so uh, the tradition actually, I believe, started with our Russian cosmonaut colleagues that uh, you have an indicator that when your engine's cut off and you're in space, the, you're still strapped in your seat, but your little friend can float up and kind of show the world that you've reached the microgravity. So um, Gwyn Gwyn came along with uh, the four of us on Crew Dragon, and uh, he kind of trails along after us sometimes uh, throughout the day. Kind of like your mascot up there. Uh, we have just a few more minutes left here, so I just want to make sure that I've gotten to all of my questions. Um, for both of you, and Shane, I'll start with you on this one. What has been the biggest surprise for you as an astronaut and living in this type of environment on the International Space Station? Uh, very good question. The biggest surprise probably was how much, um, and I don't know if it's such a surprise, but all the work we do up here and the variety of work we do that Megan was alluding to earlier was, was very, very surprising to me. And all the work that goes into making a procedure for us to do something, whether it's science or a maintenance task, is uh, mind boggling to me. So just kind of understanding that whole system and knowing that all these incredible people on the ground and, and all the mission control centers around the world are creating these products for us daily um, is really amazing to me and a, a bit surprising, honestly. Um, I just didn't realize the, you know, the vastness of how much work goes into making a normal day up here for all of us. Mm. Megan, what about you? What's been the biggest surprise for you? I think in addition to what Shane said, what was surprising for me was how much planning we have to go through individually in planning out our day. So our scheduled activities are, you know, on the timeline, but in order to get through your own personal getting ready in the morning, getting your breakfast, you're doing that, and then you're already thinking about, okay, now I need to plan ahead for my lunch because I only have so much time to get this done. So all of the things that on Earth can be very, very simple can take a little bit more planning uh, to do them efficiently up here. So, so kind of mapping out your whole day and then looking into the next day to make sure that you you don't get behind the uh, the red line that marches across the schedule all day long. Megan this summer and this is my final question here you will turn 50 on the International Space Station. Did you ever dream when you were a child that at 50 this is where you would be? 
I'm sure that as a child, I thought by 50, I'd be in a rocking chair on a porch somewhere. Um, but, uh, but I feel full of life. Of course, I'm thrilled to be up here, and I'll be thrilled to be celebrating my 50th birthday up here with my friends. Astronauts Megan MacArthur and Shane Kimbrough, it's been an absolute treat to talk to you. Modern technology is a beautiful thing, and I'm glad we had this conversation. Stay safe. Thanks, Heather. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the KFMB TV portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from Spaceflight Now. Station, this is Stephen Clark with Spaceflight Now. How do you hear me? Hello, Stephen. We have you loud and clear. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. Hi. Th thank you for taking the time to chat with me. Um, and you're three weeks into your mission, and I, I just... Uh, Shane, I wanted to ask you, you've joined a small but growing group of astronauts who have launched into space on three different kinds of vehicles. Uh, I'm curious in how Falcon 9 compared to the shuttle and Soyuz. What was that experience like? Well, I've had a few people ask me that. That's a great question. I think it's kind of somewhere in between the two. Shuttle, to me, was uh, you're shaking around, rocking and rolling a lot more. Um, Soyuz was super smooth, and the Dragon was kind of somewhere in between. So it was it was a, all, all together a smooth ride uphill, but there were a few kind of rumblings and bumps along the way, some great G-forces we got to feel. So I kind of put it in, in between those two rides of the Soyuz and the shuttle. I, I'm particularly interested in how was the ride on the MVAC engine. It's a big engine close to the capsule firing you into orbit. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. So after the first stage engine shut off, we had a few seconds of, of weightlessness, and then the MVAC kicked in, and it was a really nice uh, kick in the pants, so to speak. Uh, we got to kind of suck back in our seats, and we got to feel that great acceleration for the next six minutes or so. And what is life like on the Crew Dragon compared to shuttle and Soyuz? You know, how, how roomy is it? Uh, how long would you feel comfortable living inside Dragon, uh, you know, on its own, not coming to ISS? Uh, that's, that's a tough one there. I mean, we, we've had the luxury of taking a day or so to get here, just about a day for us. I think they're going to work on getting that uh, down a little bit to less than a day. Uh, but certainly Inspiration4 is going to be living in it for two to five days, I think, is the current plan. And uh, I would not want to be living in there more than a few days, personally, uh, with a bunch of people in there. Now, I'm getting the, the privilege of living in there right now while it's attached to the space station because we don't have enough sleep stations. But um, I think orbiting around and with four you know, people or so in there, two to three days would probably be about the limit for me personally. And Megan, you're three weeks into your mission. Uh, you've now surpassed the length of your first shuttle flight back in 09. How are you settling in, and what are your first impressions of the ISS? It is definitely a different mindset to do a long-duration mission than to do the uh, short-duration shuttle mission. For shuttle, we were very task-focused. We trained you know, for all of the specific tasks that we knew we were going to do. We trained them over and over again. And for station, you're more kind of a skills-based training so that you prepare to handle the different, all the different things that you might see up here. So it definitely is It's a different mindset knowing that I'm going to be here for a long time. Um, I feel like I'm adjusted. I feel like my body has adapted. I'm getting better and better at moving around. Of course, the volume is so much bigger than space shuttle, and so it's a lot more room to maneuver and practice your, your flying tricks. Um, but it is daily life, so you have to figure out how to manage your energy, get all the work done and um, be ready to get all the work done again tomorrow and for the next, you know, 180 days. So um, it's, it's, we're here for the long haul, but we're having fun. Uh, this is a really a fun crew, and uh, it's just it's been great getting used to it so far. And for Megan as well, Russia confirmed yesterday that they will launch a, a film crew to the ISS in October, an actress and a director. Uh, that's going to be toward the end of your mission. 
by our count, there are 12 civilian or non-government astronauts set to launch into orbit before the end of January of next year. And that's the same number of professional government astronauts launching in the same period, if you count U.S., Russia, ESA, and China. Uh, I'm interested in, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Are we at a turning point in, the, in human space flight? Uh, and how risky of an endeavor is human space flight today? Uh, is, it, is it time for this change? Well, I think that I know that in, in our country, we've been talking for about 10 years about how to boost, you know, a commercial space economy. Um, and it looks like there's enough interest and enough excitement right now that some of that is really starting to happen. And so I think overall that that's very exciting. I think the more people that are interested in traveling to space and achieving things in space, the, the more different ways we're going to have to get here, the more um, efficient things are going to get, maybe the more comfortable things are going to get. So I think it's a very interesting time. And I'm, and I'm just looking forward to seeing how it all plays out. Uh, for, for either one of you, uh, you, know, you know, do you think the, the risk uh, calculation uh, adds up to being able to, to accommodate civilians on the ISS? Is the ISS ready to accommodate those visitors? I'm sure the people that are, uh, you know, getting the, getting those flights ready are thinking about that. We're, you know, personally, I think they're going to be fine. There's a lot of safety things, a lot of training that all those crews will have to go through to be able to respond to emergencies on the vehicle as well as on the space station. So that's the bottom line. Once they can do that, then all the other things, either somebody up here can help teach them or they can just watch for a little bit until they, until they figure it out, just like any new crew member, honestly. So uh, I think they're going to be just fine once they go through all the training. And Shane, this is your third visit to the station. Um, curious in your impressions of how it's changed since your previous missions in 08 and in 2016. Uh, is there a lot more hardware up there? Is it a different pace of activity? Uh, just your impressions. Yeah, since my first flight on the shuttle, I think there's been a few more modules added. Um, since my flight a few years ago, not much has changed um, with the modules, but a lot more stuff is up here. There's a lot of, a lot of new payloads. There's a new glove box in the, the Japanese module, um, things like that. There's a lot more stowage, meaning uh, there's, there's sometimes that's trash, sometimes that's equipment that's kind of everywhere. So we're trying to manage that. Um, as we get ready to send a cargo vehicle home here in the next month or so, and then our, another one's going to arrive here in a couple of weeks. So it's going to get really busy, and things are just going to get worse for a little bit until we can get a few things out of here. And, and Megan, that leads me into my next question. There's a lot of hardware coming up to ISS in the next few months. And, of course, things can change. The lays are part of the space business, but you've got a new cargo ship with solar arrays, a new Russian module, uh, Starliner's first docking all uh, later this summer. And at least that recent memory, I can't remember an increment with such a variety of new things. Uh, you know, what about that excites you the most? Uh, do you feel lucky to be there during this period of time? And uh, uh, what are you doing to, re to prepare the space station to get all that new delivery? Well, honestly, Stephen, it is the variety of things that I find the most exciting. There's not one specific thing out of all of those that's the most exciting, but a new vehicle coming up, a cargo vehicle that's going to allow, or it's going to bring hardware for folks to go out and do an EVA that's going to involve also robotics. That's very exciting. A new module on the Russian side, all of that is just, is it's a lot of stuff, like you said. And figuring out how to manage all of that is a challenge. I think that will be um, just be really interesting for all of us. So the things that we can do to prepare, obviously, um, for a cargo ve vehicle in particular, is try to sort of batten down the hatches as much as we can before it gets here, make uh, make room in places, get more efficient with the stowage that we already have up here so we have room to move things off. And, and it's a challenge. I mean, it, there's a lot of stuff up here, and that will definitely be a challenge. But I think we're motivated. We've always known that this month coming up is going to be a super busy month, and we're excited for it. So we've had, we've had kind of a nice uh, ramp up to that time period, and we're going to be ready for it. I think I've got just a little over a minute left. I uh, just wanted to ask, you've got seven people up there, five USOS crew members. Mike Hopkins had to sleep in his uh, Dragon spacecraft throughout his increment. Uh, have you got a new sleep station set up yet? Uh, is someone still bunking in the Dragon? How's that all working out? Yeah, I'm the lucky one that's uh, in the Dragon, and uh, we're working on the new sleep station that's going to be in the European module. And that's uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks we'll have that ready to go. But uh, I'm not... I'm not too anxious to move out. The window views are pretty great. <laughs>
you to both of you for your time and uh, good luck with the re rest of your expedition and uh, safe trip home. Thanks, Stephen, for joining us. Bye-bye. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes our event. Thank you to all participants from KFMB-TV and Spaceflight Now. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.